The Hillman Avenger was introduced in 1970, the first all new model unveiled while Roots was owned by Chrysler. And while it's no compromise design, one it praise and plaudits from the press and public alike, it would ultimately be the end of Roots as we would ultimately know it. But is the Avenger any good? Did it deserve to be more successful? Well, we thought we'd take a drive in this 1978 example to find out. But first, our friends at Lancaster Insurance are running monthly giveaways. You can win all sorts, from experience days to tools, restaurant vouchers, and tech. So click the link below at the end of the video to enter their latest competition. It was back in the mid 60s that the management at Roots wanted to develop a car to sit below the Hunter, the Arrow range that was being developed at the time. They wanted a B segment car. Its criteria was quite simple. It had to appeal to the family man and the company car user in equal measure. Interior packaging was essential. Short overhangs were the order of the day to maximize interior space. It would also have to have a stylish exterior to appeal to as many tastes as possible. Americana-esque styling was the order of the day. An American style front end and a sort of swooping C-pillar, almost fastback design for a saloon. That exterior was signed off in 1965 and work continued on developing the interior. There was a lot of attention paid to the materials and the color choices used on the interior. They also wanted a facial that was distinct for each model that you chose. Ultimately, the interior wasn't signed off until a couple of years after the exterior in 1967. Engineers did toy with the more radical permutations of the drivetrain and suspension, but ultimately, cost and simplicity prevailed. A 1248cc and a 1598cc overhead valve four-cylinder engine in line driving the rear wheels to a four-speed manual gearbox. Conventional strut suspension up front and coil sprung live axle at the back. Not only did that help with cost, it also helped with manufacturing. It meant the Avenger could be assembled in different factories around the world, including in places like South Africa where local content rules would have dictated it needed a locally sourced engine. Actually, Peugeot-derived engine could drop into the front without too many complications. So the Avenger finally went on sale in 1970, slotting in below the Hillman Hunter. But unlike the Hunter, which would have also come as a Singer, Sunbeam and Humber derivatives, the Avenger was only known as a Hillman. The trim levels were Deluxe, Super and GL, the top of the range. A sportier 1500 GT model was introduced shortly afterwards, while the estate model came into being in 1972. In an effort to reduce costs and also bring out a more fleet-friendly bargain basement model, certain amounts of equipment were removed from the lower spec cars in 1973. Lower spec cars lost the standard front anti-roll bar. The disc brakes up front were replaced by drums, something of a retrograde step, I think you'll agree. But at the other end of the scale was the Avenger Tiger with its distinctive Sundance yellow paint job. Its twin Weber 1498cc engine produced about 90 horsepower. It was the perfect kind of halo model. They took the Avenger Tiger motorsporting in the mid to late 70s. The engine at one point being a two litre double overhead cam 16 valve with over 200 horsepower. Come 1976, however, trouble was brewing. Chrysler, the owner of Roots at that time, was losing patience that its UK division was very much losing money. The cute, radical, but ultimately unsuccessful Hillman Imp produced up at Linwood was canned, and the factory up there was at risk of closure. The government intervened with a bailout plan, so the Avenger production moved up to Linwood, therefore saving the factory and some 25,000 jobs. The Avenger was produced at the Wrighton factory in Coventry, so when the Avenger moved up to Scotland, Wrighton started to produce effectively the Simca-based Chrysler Alpine. So all seemed to be well, but in truth, I think patience was well and truly on the way out. Chrysler ultimately sold its European operations to Peugeot Citroen, and that coincided with the Avenger getting a facelift to make it look broadly like the Chrysler Alpine, hence the revised front end that you get on this particular model, and the distinctive boomerang taillights of those early cars were replaced. That sale to Peugeot Citroen ultimately meant that the by then Chrysler Avenger became known as the Talbot Avenger at the tail end of 1979. In fact, my dad had a Talbot Avenger, but it still had Chrysler badges, a Chrysler key, but Talbot script written on the leading edge of the bonnet. The Avenger ultimately soldered on until 1981, at which point production finished, the Linwood factory was closed, and the Avenger saloon at least was replaced by the Alpine derived Talbot Solara. And it's a real shame because the Avenger is a good car. We're driving a 1978 with the now 1.6 engine instead of the 1.5. The 1248 became a 1298 and therefore a 1.3 by then. It's a good car. 
And while come the facelift, the interior was a bit more bland, shall we say, a bit lacking in character. It all works sort of very well. On this top spec GL model, I've got a large speedo, a large rev counter, and four smaller gauges with a distinctive analog clock for good measure. I love the distinctive steering wheel. I definitely remember driving my father's Avenger sitting on his lap, and this steering wheel was very much what I remember. The suspension's pretty good. The ride's actually quite decent. For a very basic suspension setup, it definitely works. The steering is light and a little lacking in feel, but it's okay. The four-speed box has got a very deliberately mechanical feel, but it's quite precise, quite light and easy to use. It was unclear really whether the Avenger really was a Cortina or Marina competitor. I was talking to Joe about this earlier and I think we concluded that the Avenger probably was genuinely conceived as a Cortina rival in the 60s, but by the time it came out in 1970 and we had a larger Mark III Cortina, arguably the Avenger then sat between two classes. Come a 1973 road test, Motor Magazine pitched it firmly against the likes of the Renault 12, Vauxhall Viva, Triumph Toledo and even the Austin Allegro. It compared pretty favourably all round, both in terms of price, acceleration, top speed and fuel consumption. I guess ultimately the Avenger did deserve to do better. It was well made, it was well engineered, it was designed with some thought and attention to detail, but arguably it got overshadowed by the better selling Cortina, the homegrown Morris Marina. But also crucially there was the encroaching competition from Japan which often made cars that were more reliable. People were starting to look further afield and the Roots Group by then were starting to look decidedly lacklustre. And they certainly wouldn't have been the first car company to find itself suffering from ill fortunes come the mid-70s. I'll always have fond memories of Avengers. My father had three of them, a Hillman Avenger, a Chrysler Avenger and a Talbot Avenger, so it really evokes strong memories of my childhood. My mother's friend had a Hillman Avenger, which she subsequently left at our house where, while she emigrated to Australia. That Americana styling wasn't lost on us and we pretended it was a kind of scaled down Dodge Charger. History should look kindly on the Avenger. They're super rare now, but well worthy classic car. One of the best of its day. I just love it. This video is proudly sponsored by Lancaster Insurance. Give them a call on 01480 400 889 for an insurance quote on your classic car. And don't forget to click the link below to enter their latest competition.